Welcome, Mount Moriah and guests to our Bible study on today. Thank you for choosing Mount Moriah as your place of study. On today we are continuing our conversation through the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 30 verses 10 through 23 will be the focus of our attention on today. So let me read these verses from the New International Version. Proverbs 30, verses 11 through 24. I'm sorry, verses 10 through 24. From the New International Version, it reads, Do not slander a servant to their master, or they will curse you and you will pay for it. There are those who curse their fathers and do not bless their mothers, those who are pure in their own eyes and yet are not cleansed of their filth. Those whose eyes are ever so haughty, whose glances are so disdainful, those whose teeth are swords and whose jaws are set with knives to devour the poor from the earth and the needy from among mankind. The leech has two daughters, give, give, they cry. There are three things that are never satisfied, four that never say enough. The grave, the barren womb, land which is never satisfied with water, and fire which never says enough. The eye that marks a father, the scorn of an aged mother, will be pecked out by the ravens of the valley, will be eaten by the vultures. There are three things that are so amazing for me, four that I do not understand. The way of an eagle in the sky, the way of a snake on a rock, the way of a ship on the high seas, and the way of a man with a young woman. This is the way of an adulterous woman. She eats and wipes her mouth and says, I've done nothing wrong. Under three things, the earth trembles. Under four, it cannot bear up. A servant who becomes king, a godless fool who gets plenty to eat, a contemptible woman who gets married, and a servant who displaces her mistress. Amen. Thus ending the reading of God's word, Proverbs 30, uh, verses 10 through 23. Let us pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for this opportunity to study on today. And we thank you for your power and your presence in our midst. And we ask and pray that you would bless us as we dialogue with one another. In the name of the Christ, we pray and give thanks. Amen. So here we are. We are in the next to the last section of the book of Proverbs. The last section being the words of Luminel and a hymn to a, a valiant woman. That's the entirety of Proverbs chapter 31 in which we are all familiar with. If you recall, we started this this journey through Proverbs uh, chapters 1 through 9, which talk about the parental legacy, wisdom's worldview. And then we talked about the first collection of sayings of King Solomon, chapters 10 through 22, verse 16. And then the sayings of the wise, Proverbs chapter 22, verse 17, through chapter 24, verse 34. And then the second sayings or collections of sayings of King Solomon, Proverbs chapter 25 in its entirety. And now we are in uh, this fifth section, the words of Agur, curses and numerical sayings, which is Proverbs 30 in its entirety. Last time we looked at verses 1 through Nine, and if we have time, we'll see how far we can get in verses 10 through 23. So let's dig in, into this. Verse 10 reads, Do not slander a servant to their master, or they will curse you, and you will pay for it. This will link... Uh, the next section of verses, verses 11 through 14, by this whole theme of blessing and cursing. Remember, 
Wisdom comes from God. God gives it to man. Man can be the pastor, the Sunday school teacher, mother, father, grandmother, grandfather, aunt, uncle, principal, teacher, professor, etc. That wisdom is given to us, and if we practice that wisdom, blessings will come to us. We will live. We will receive eternal life. On the other hand, if we do not pay attention to that godly wisdom, then we will um, be cursed. That curse leads to ruin. Ruin leads to death. It leads to eternal death. So think about the servant master relationship. The servant is in a vulnerable position with respect to their masters. And the servant's only recourse against their master is to appeal to God for justice. And that appeal to God for justice, the servant hopes, results in some type of curse. That might be the recourse of, of a servant who has been violated by their master. We know that there is this power imbalance between master and servant, and God's desire is to protect the servant. So verse 10 assures the weak that God will give them justice when they are wrongly accused. Again, God is a God of justice. Verses 11 through 14, let me read them again. There are those who curse their fathers and do not bless their mothers, those who are pure in their own eyes and yet are not cleansed of their filth, those whose eyes are ever so haughty, whose glances are so disdainful, those whose teeth are swords and whose jaws are set with knives to devour the poor from the earth and the needy from among mankind. Here we have a catalog of vices. There are those who, a generation of who, a circle of those who. And we see this whole notion of prophetic urgency and even indignation. This focuses on the collective character of sin. It basically tells us the wrongdoing is done in packs by those who have this common spirit of wickedness. We see that this whole notion of the cursing of parents is forbidden. In the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, uh, we also know that there is deception and self-appraisal when people think too highly of themselves, when people think that they are pure in their eyes, that is deception. This loftiness of the eyes can refer to pride. We know that it is a sin to be prideful. And imagine uh, this whole notion of greediness by the powerful that is used against the weak. They are uh, sinful as well. And this whole notion of the image of speech uh, as, as teeth is, is also wicked. So uh, the cursing of uh, fathers and, and mothers, that is sinful. Those who uh, think more highly of themselves, um, that, is, that is sinful. Those who exercise pride, uh, that is sinful. Those who basically use words as swords and knives, that is sinful. And those who practice greed taken from the poor, that is also sinful. Um, sinful as well. So we see um, the writer of Proverbs basically giving us some examples of what this sinful character looks like. 
In verse uh, 15, the leash, leash has two daughters. Give, give, they cry. Here begins a series of numerical sayings in which we see numbers given. Uh, but in verse 15, we see the instability of things, whether they be human or cosmic. We see four elements, fire, earth, water, and air. Uh, the addition is, is soul or the grave. And I'm dabbling now into verse 16. I'll read it in a minute. And we see that the grave is never filled with the dead. And then we see this whole notion of a barren womb, a, a mother who is pregnant. And basically, we see uh, verse 16 saying that the womb cannot replace what the grave devours. So let me read verses 15 and 16 uh, together. The leash has two daughters, give, give, they cry. There are three things that are never satisfied, four that never say enough. The grave, the burned womb, land which is never satisfied with water, and fire which never says enough. So let me go back a little bit. Three things that are never satisfied. The grave the barren womb, land, and water. Those four things never say enough. There are three things that are never satisfied. The grave, the barren womb, and fire. And so again, we see the instability of things. Four elements, fire, earth, water, air, the addition of soul or the grave. The grave is never filled with the dead, and the barren womb can never replace what the grave devours. Verses 15 and 16. Verse 17 reads uh, this way, The eye that marks a father that scorns an aged mother, will be pecked out by the ravens of the valley, will be eaten by the vultures. In verse 17, we have a verse that basically corresponds to verse 11. Uh, talks about the sins of the eye in verse 11 and talks about it again in verse 17. The eyes graphically portray the law of retribution. Retribution where uh, the punishment fits the crime. And we, we see that in, in, verse, in verse 17. Uh, we see that basically the I that marks a father, that scorns an aged mother uh, will be pecked out by the ravens of the valley and would be eaten by the vultures. What that basically means is that uh, when the corpse is abandoned, when a person dies, it is eaten by the beasts or the birds of the air. And so this type of brutalness, this type of harshness is, is meant to convey the ultimate wrongness of cursing parents. We don't curse our parents, we bless them. And when we curse them, this same type of brutal harshness that we have displayed towards them will come back on us. We see it here in the plucking out of an eye by beasts or by the birds of the air when one dies. Verses 18 through 20, I love them, portray uh, the simple wonder at the marvelous phenomena in God's creation. Let me read verses 18 uh, through, through 20. It reads, there are three things that our soul 
that are too amazing for me, four that I do not understand. The way of an eagle in the sky, the way of a snake on a rock, the way of a ship on the high seas, and the way of a man with a young woman. This is the way of an adulterous woman. She eats and wipes her mouth and says, I have done nothing wrong. So we have the simple wonder of the marvelous phenomena in God's creation. And then verse 20 uh, culminates with the mystery of sexual love. It basically says that the marvels of creation are beyond human comprehension. We cannot fully understand creation because we are finite, limited in our thinking. We see three and four references uh, to this created phenomenon. They are beyond understanding. They may seem a little scientific in nature, but they are beyond that. They are joyful examples of the way that God has made this world. It talks about the aesthetic awe at what God has made indescribably beautiful. All four excite the poet's amazement and joy. The four, again, they are amazing to him. Three things that are amazing to him. The way of an eagle in the sky, the way of a snake on a rock, the way of a ship on high seas. Those three are amazing to him. Four things he does not understand. The way of an eagle in the sky, the way of a rock, a snake rather on a rock, the way of a ship on the high seas, and the way of a man with a young woman. They are beyond his understanding. And then he comes back and says in verse 20, uh, all of that is cool, but the most wonderful thing of all is the way of a man and a woman. And the way of a man with a young woman. He says uh, that that basically is the most wonderful thing of all. Birds fly and soar in the air. It's freedom. Think about an eagle in the air flying. It's, it's freedom. Not only is, is freedom, um, but also the way that, the way that it, it does all of this. It is simply uh, amazing to, to both. The way that the birds fly. Think about the snake that moves through the rock and how it moves mysteriously through, through the rock without feet. And think about how the ship maneuvers its way in the heart of the sea. That rhythmic movement as the ship, ship plunges through wave after waves of water with unfathomable hidden depths. So we see the way that these things, uh, the, the bird, the snake, and the ship move from the three realms of creation, the earth, the air, and the water, to culminate in this human realm. Of all creation, we think about male and female are the crown of God. And so we see how the writer is amazed by the relationship between 
a man and a woman. And he sings praise uh, for God's grace. So we see this delight and wonder at sexuality in verse 19. This whole notion of how this relationship between a man and a, a woman amazes him. Amazes him so much that he doesn't understand to this whole notion of a disturbing picture of something good gone wrong. The relationship between a man and a woman amazes him, but we see in verse 20 this whole notion of adultery, which he says is not an act of the creator. This is the way of an adulterous woman. She eats and wipes her mouth and says, I have done nothing, I have done nothing wrong. This adulterous woman commits adultery or has sex outside of marriage. And it is compared to eating and the casually wiping of a mouth may be literal, it may be figurative, but it is not a godly deed. And even worse than the act is the lack of guilt or remorse. As if the deed will be wiped away just as someone eats and casually wipes their mouth. As if there are no physical or moral tracks left like the ship on the seas, it, uh, the ship as it goes by that which it has left behind that were waves at a certain time become waves no longer. So it is not the act itself, but it, worse than the act is the lack of guilt or remorse as if you can just commit sin and there are no repercussions. As if you can just do it and uh, eat and wipe your mouth and be done away with it. Whether it be adultery or sex in general, um, the writer of Proverbs 30 says that there are repercussions for it. think that that's something that we need to ponder upon. So let's look at what Jesus says about this or the New Testament says about some of this. Let's look at Matthew uh, chapter, chapter 3. And let's look at, at, verse, at verse 7. It reads, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 3, verse 7, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptized, and he said to them, you brought a vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children from Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce fruit will be thrown out and thrown into the fire. Jesus basically says what the writer of Proverbs says, that 
We might think that we can escape the repercussions of our sins, but we cannot. There are repercussions for our sins. There is repercussions when we act foolishly. And instead of doing things, Jesus says, uh, that are sinful, what we need to do is that we need to practice wisdom and do things that are fruitful. And Jesus basically says that if we do not produce fruit, then we will be thrown into the fire, cut down first and thrown into the fire. So if we do not practice fruitfulness, which in my opinion is not being wise, but it is being foolish, then eternal death will be our destination. But if we produce fruit, practice wisdom, that does not suggest that we will be perfect. But what it does suggest that is that we practice wisdom, blessings will come to us, we will live, and we will receive eternal life. When we fall, do the foolish thing. All we have to do is to repent, ask God for forgiveness, and if it's true in our heart, God will, through Jesus Christ, cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for this opportunity to study on today. And we ask and pray that you would allow us to apply this study to our lives. In the name of the Christ, we pray and give thanks. Amen.